face the difficulties of today and tomorrow. I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. This nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Good evening and welcome to episode two of the Policy Dialogue series with alumni, staff, faculty, and students from the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. The views expressed do not represent official positions of the school or alumni network. But our goal is to discuss specific policy solutions that can address and solve the current local, national, and interna international challenges we face. We are recording this on October 1st, 2020. My name is Evan Papp, and I graduated with the class of 2011 with a focus on international security, economic policy. Uh, I am the executive producer of Empathy Media Labs, which focuses on labor, political economy, art, and culture. Joining me tonight are fellow alumni, Esther Rodriguez, Sanam Opata, and Jazz Lewis. How is everyone doing tonight? I'm doing okay. Um, I'm happy to be on uh, with, with everyone. Uh, to those watching for the first time, uh, my name is Jazz Lewis. I graduated in 2014 from the School of Public Policy. I also went to Maryland undergrad. Uh, my focus in School of Public Policy was international development and federal acquisition. I uh, served in two capacities, one on the Hill, working for Congressman Steny Hoyer as a senior policy advisor, focusing on issues of criminal justice reform and economic mobility. And I also serve in the Maryland legislature as a, as a state delegate representing Prince George's County. Um, and I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Jess. Who wants to go next with the introduction? I can go. Um, I'm doing well. I'm very excited to be a part of this conversation. Um, my name is Sven Mopata, and I am a recent grad from UMD uh, class of 2020 um, in the undergraduate program. A little bit about my background. Um, last summer, I interned with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, had the opportunity to work on the Hill for Congressman Elijah Cummings. Um, I continued that internship in the following fall semester, and then after that, I interned for the Oversight Committee um, in the House of Representatives, and now I work for um, a congressional subcommittee under Oversight. Very cool. We're happy to have you on, especially on such short notice. And Thank you. Esther, please. Um, hi again. Um, my name is Esther Rodriguez. I uh, graduated with the School of Public Policy um, in 2018. Um, I was part of the very first um, undergraduate cohort. Um, it's a fairly new major at the University of Maryland. Um, after graduation, I pursued a um, master's in education policy at American University. Um, just graduated in May. And currently, I am at the University of Maryland. I am working in two capacities, uh, one with undergraduate studies to help recruit and help with programming. And I am also working um, on a brand new initiative uh, called Civic Maryland. And the purpose is to increase civic engagement, education, participation, not just on campus, but you know, community-wide. It's great to be here. Great, thank you. So tonight we're gonna to be discussing policies around the COVID response, the Supreme Court, and the election. But first, let's talk a little bit about the presidential debate or I don't even know if we can call it a de debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Uh, did people watch it? What, what are the, the general thoughts? Uh, who wants to go first on this one? There's a little bit of, I'll, yeah, please. Yeah, start us off. Yeah, please, thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll start us off and then I'll hand it off. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was a, a train wreck from beginning to end. Um, I thought it was very unconventional, uh, which we should expect by now. Um, it seemed to me at certain points, I couldn't tell if uh, the, the President Joe Biden and former Vice President Joe Biden were the ones debating versus uh, you know, President Trump and the moderator um, who seemed to not be able to get uh, control 
Substantively, I thought the debate was, was lacking. It didn't really seem like we were able to get much substance out of that conversation as opposed to more of like a, a just a raw show of power and badgering uh, of one another, like who can talk over each other, who can fluster one another. I did feel that the only little bit of strategy that I saw in the debate, I would say on, on behalf of President Trump, is that I think he tried to take advantage of Joe Biden's stutter, knowing that uh, when he gets nervous, it can take him time to uh, communicate his message, um, which is a common thing if you, if you know people who struggle with, with stuttering. I, I think that was probably why he was performing that way. I kind of look back to the 16 debates and he did not do that to Hillary Clinton, surprisingly. Um, you know, he stalked her across the stage, uh, which he didn't do uh, to Biden, but um, the talking over was new. Uh, Joe Biden, I thought he did a really good job talking directly to the camera, uh, to people trying to focus the conversation on uh, everyday people and how policy affects them that I thought was uh, the only takeaway I could, I could get from, uh, from the debate. Great. Uh, Sanam, if you want to, uh, were you able to watch it as well? Uh, what was yeah, um, I did tune in. I didn't watch the entire thing. Um, I don't think I could stand it for its entirety, to be completely honest. Um, I wasn't surprised with like the lack of decorum in that space. I wasn't surprised with the way that the president conducted himself. Um, I did feel that, you know, some low blows and shots were thrown, which again, isn't unsurprising, but I think just a little bit disappointing to see people, you know, uh, of that degree and stature kind of behave in that manner. And one thing that really struck me was the topic of race when it came up and when the president was discussing how he would, how he is going to be eliminating um, like cultural competency training, cultural sensitivity training. Um, and I was just very, very, very upset to hear that. And that was something that struck me for sure, especially in light of all that's going on with the Black Lives Matter movement and, and whatnot. Um, but yeah. I mean, I think I, like most people, um, were kind of glued to the TV, um, half shock, sometimes nervous laughter, um, sometimes yelling, at least I was. Um, but I was also on social media and I was texting um, a couple close friends. Um, and a friend of mine um, who spent a lot of time on the Hill, he's a lobbyist, um, he was also with the National Hispanic Caucus for State Legislators. Um, I think he, his, his last post after um, watching the debate um, pretty much sums it up for me. Um, and he said, can't shake the sinking feeling like we've reached the nadir of the American Republic. And I actually do think we can get lower, but, um, I'm not gonna lie, I am petrified and I'm not normally um, this afraid. Um, I, I knew when he won in 2016 that the effects of this election were gonna be catastrophic, but I never expected something like this. Um, so that debate didn't do much to put me at ease, um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, Nothing is surprising anymore, I guess, in American politics. Um, I, obviously, you'd want to cut off the mic, but that wasn't negotiated beforehand. Um, there was no control. Uh, Chris Wallace just completely um, talked about $750 in taxes from Trump. And as Biden was getting into it, um, Trump jumped in, shut Biden down from talking about it, and Chris Wallace moved to the next topic. Uh, if I was Biden, I, I would focus more on Trump's, you know, being a money laundering crime syndicate family. And I would focus on the fact that he's constantly beyond all the, the terrible things he's done, focusing on the, the labor piece that Trump is constantly has, um, you know, screwed all of his uh, contract workers throughout all of his businesses. And I do a lot of work uh, with unions on editing the Labor Radio Podcast Network. Um, that's not necessarily my background, but I've been really trying to learn more and more about it. And Trump is horrible for unions. 
but 50% of these rank and file members are going to be voting for this guy uh, because of false, like a false consciousness that they think that he's representing them through his, his rhetoric. And I, Biden is doing a good job. Um, he, he took a train from Cleveland to Johnstown uh, after the debate. And I, I love seeing him on the Amtrak. I think we need to rebuild our trains. And uh, I, I think Biden should really be attacking him on those, those two lines. Well, he can't really attack him when he can't get a word in edgewise, right? True, very true. I mean, and I also think Biden is, you know, he's old school. Um, he's gonna try and keep it clean. Um, he's not gonna go after his family, however corrupt they are. He's just not gonna do that. Um, and it's not because he doesn't want people going after his kids, but like, he's just not gonna do it. You know, he's, you know, he comes from a different era and, um, you know, he still wants politicians to be decent people. Um, even if they disagree, you know, he's still one of those people that wants to lead by example, right? Um, so I don't expect him to go boxing next time, you know, if there is a next time. Um, President tweeted today that he is not going to agree to any changes because, you know, it worked for him the last time and he clearly won that debate. And, you know, it's all about his ego. It's like, th this isn't about winning or losing a debate. Honestly, it's about, you know, at this point, for the most part, most of us know who we're going to vote for, right? It's about trying to convince those that might, for whatever reason, be um, on the fence, right? And um, he thinks that, that, yeah, he won't agree to any terms. So it's possible that they, they might say, okay, then we won't participate in the next two debates. I think... Um... You know, so I, I, I put myself through the punishment. I watched the whole thing. Um, and uh, my wife told me not to. And, and like Esther, I went through moments of laughing like this can't be real uh, to being angry like I can't believe this is, this is real. Like we know this is our representation, uh, but it's hard seeing that because we don't actively watch him every day, right? And to imagine like that is what is in the situation room, right? That is the one who's representing us to world leaders. Um, it's not even horrifying, it's just angry. It's just angering at this point because it's not what we think or people who think of America as a positive thing wants to see either. Um, it it kind of displays a lot of uh, the things that we are challenged with on, on Front Street. But, I, but I'll say, from watching the whole thing, the first third, I think, um, uh, President Trump kind of dominated just speaking over Biden and both uh, Chris Wallace, the moderator, and Vice President Biden were trying to adapt to that. It wasn't anticipated. It wasn't what was agreed to. Uh, so if you only watch the first third, I feel like, you know, just who got more words in, if that's your measure, then Trump definitely won, right? Um, I think the second and third, like the part of the debate, um, I think Joe Biden clearly won because he, start, he started to clap back a little bit, which I liked. Um, but not just that, he started to drive messages. So like uh, Dems in the House took back the House under leadership of Nancy Pelosi and Steve Hoyer and other people by focusing on healthcare. Right, so he kind of pulled the conversation back from all the little things people want to talk about um, to healthcare and what his plan would look like, and then kind of prompted, you know, uh, President Trump to say what his plan was, which he didn't have. Okay, and then he kind of turned to the camera and was just like, "You heard it, folks. <laughs> you know, there's a plan on the table that I have. There isn't one here. Uh, he wants to talk about sides of our rallies. You know, and." He doesn't, you know, he forces anyone who gets close to him to put on a mask, whereas I'm telling you to stay home and be safe, et cetera, et cetera. They talked about mail-in ballots and the election process. And I thought that Joe Biden did a decent job of trying to remind people that five states currently do their elections entirely through mail-in ballots. Uh, Dems and Republicans, it's not a partisan thing. Uh, there's no degree of fraud that's, that's shown with it. Um, you know, if you have concerns on policy, I thought he did a good job trying to bring the conversation back to some semblance of, of policy. 
Um, I do think that his, his stutter made the first part very, very difficult for him and to folks who weren't aware of the severity of his stutter. I think that's been exacerbated during this presidency because he's had it his whole life. But all of a sudden, I think many of us, you know, you, if you didn't know that, you, you would think like, you know, is he just not responsive? You have questions of age popping up. Uh, but knowing the stutter thing, it, it makes a lot more sense. I have a, a younger cousin of mine who had to have a, a speech coach who stutters to this day, and she has triggers that helps her move along. And if you interrupt her, uh, it, it slows her down. Um, so I was I was aware of that, but I'm aware that uh, that can throw folks off because it looked like he was just lost in the sauce. And just a, uh, you know, kind of like personalized uh, feedback. My mom, uh, she lives in Cleveland and I grew up in Michigan and some of her friends um, that she fights constantly with uh, are Republican and voted for Trump. And they are, they, I can't believe like it's taken them this long, but they watched that last night and they're just absolutely appalled and even further disgusted and embarrassed and coming to my mom after my mom's been berating them for four years and saying, what the hell are you doing? Um, they're actually concerned. I think, I think it's now going to be a blowout election. And I think, you know, the end talking about the proud boys, you know, stand back, stand by. Uh, I think his, his next strategy, because he's about to get blown out is, is just to make sure the votes aren't actually count counted. That's, that's what I think was revealed as well. We could beat this over the head uh, again and again. Uh, if there's nothing else, we can uh, move on to the next topic. Any any other words on this uh, train wreck? Okay, we'll we'll move on then to a, another very. All right, I do have to bring up one point, um, and I am going to be honest. I don't know who's moderating the next two, but I will say that there was one issue that was not spoken about at all, and that's immigration. You know. There was no mention of DACA. There was no mention of kids in cages. Like Latinx was not covered at all. And um, I don't know if that's Chris Wallace. I don't know who comes up with those questions, but that's a huge misstep, huge. Um, so that's something that I'm definitely gonna be looking out for in the next election, not election, I'm sorry, in the next, um, in the next debate. All right, so turning to the next topic of COVID-19, we've recently passed 200,000 deaths related to COVID-19. Right now, the U.S. accounts for over a fifth of the nearly 1 million deaths reported worldwide and over a fifth of the 32 million confirmed cases, according to the John Hopkins COVID-19 dashboard. So the current policies are obviously failing relative to other nations. Uh, has anyone been personally affected by COVID? Uh, and what, what are some of your thoughts about how we can, we can have a more sane policy on this? Sanam, if you wanna, yeah. I was just, um, so I have, I have had relatives that have unfortunately contracted um, COVID. Thankfully they're fine and in good health. Um, but it definitely has impacted my family. And furthermore, with the position that I hold now, the, sub the subcommittee that I work for is called the Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Crisis. And so we're tasked with really taking a very comprehensive and in-depth look at the many facets and implications that frame COVID, um, but also furthermore, the impact that say, you know, our president and other um, governmental leaders are having in this sort of space. And, with this, with this issue. And I can just definitely say in my role and just even as an observer, like things are not okay. And I think it's very evident that our president amongst others could have taken a much more proactive role in addressing the issue, could have, you know, prevented the amount of losses and that, that our country has experienced. And I think one thing kind of even to hi highlight the debate was even I just felt that President Trump was almost somewhat dismissive of the 200,000 people that passed or trying to deflect and highlight how other countries aren't really showing you their true metrics and numbers. That shouldn't even matter. Like we can boil it down to a matter of comparison, but we also have to focus on what we are actively doing. And it's clear that we're not 
we're not handling it as we should. And unfortunately, many more people are going to die um, because of the approach that's being taken or lack thereof. Well, send him, you know, he said it is what it is. Right. <laughs> I mean, you yeah. know, I, I, I don't, I don't understand um, how his fervent supporters, right, can completely disregard that. Like, I, I, I just, I can't get it around my head. And not to minimize, like, 9-11, but obviously this 9-11, there was a lot of um, comparison, right? Um, because, you know, people look at... Uh, 9-11, the way the country handled it, the way, you know, we kind of responded, um, got together, um, and really, you know, unified for this, right? After it happened, like, I just, what's the difference, right? Except for the fact that this is so much larger, right? And so much of this was avoidable, you know? Um, I'm not sure if the number is exact, but you know, the estimates are about 90% of the deaths could have been avoided had there been really, um, you know, specific and, um, you know, just restrictive measures put in place, uh, you know, as soon as they knew the extent of this, which was pretty early on. But, you know, so the only thing that I can wrap my head around, and that now this is just me being presumptuous, but, you know, when it was 9-11, like the boogeyman was, you know, the way we framed it, and I say we, but the way um, the government framed it was the boogeyman was, you know, these, you know, 19 people, 18 people from that were Islamic terrorists. That was the boogeyman. Like, I don't know if it's because there isn't a, a like, a boogeyman, right, that's taking these lives and it's happening all over. And, um, you know, maybe they're saying, oh, well, you know, she had diabetes or, you know, she had this or I don't know how they are honestly wrapping their head around this and giving this any sort of a justification to completely disregard these lives. Right. Um, but I I just can't understand how anyone can continue to say, but the economy, when there's 200,000 less people in our country. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just, I, I can't wrap my head around that. And honestly, if they want to just look at it as numbers, all right, well, then there's 200,000 less people that are contributing to the workforce, or there's 200,000 less people that are contributing to social security, or there's 200,000 less people paying, you know, taxes. Like, I don't, I don't care how they have to like put a, a price tag on that face, right. To value it. But like, how have we become this nation where, 200,000 people are gone and it is what it is. Like, under what other president could this have happened? And a previous president so aloofly say, it is what it is. It could have been 2 million, but it's only 200,000. One's too many. Like, if, if I was in the office of the presidency and I was advising a president, I mean, it, it's so clear. The first thing you need is a, a universal testing strategy where you have a billion tests and people, you know, there's 330 million Americans. People can take a test every week and you can get it tested anywhere and you have quick results. So you can quickly identify quarantine and you can determine whether you're negative or, and it has to be free. And so part of that gets into healthcare and some of these other things. And then use the Defense Production Act to actually create the, the fact that we can't even um, have PPE, uh, personal protection equipment, and these, these masks that we can't even manufacture anymore. And they're not willing to take the Defense Production Act. And of course, you can't allow Wall Street and Boy Wonders to do these air bridges from China that go right to their friends that they can then distribute on the private market and make money on it. And having all the states bid against each other, that's, that's absurd. And then the third part of it is an Apollo program for a vaccine and using all of our university resources, uh, using uh, the CDC government agencies and you know, putting down how, how, many, how much money have we spent collectively over the last you know, six to nine months so if a hundred billion dollar program vaccine research to get get to this and then that will actually that r and d will actually create jobs and it will ensure that the u s is it continues to be a leader in in medical care as well. Jazz, do you have anything on this? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think the only way you, you have that approach where you're kind of callous to 200,000 people dying is that you don't identify with them, right? So if you don't feel like they're part of your in-group, then you don't have, what is it, empathy for the folks who are hurting um, in that situation. And, and the timeline is interesting because I feel like in late March, in the beginning of April at first, we did kind of have that unity feel for just like a, a, a split second. It was a fraction of a second where all of a sudden, it wasn't necessarily with the president, but I think a lot of the governors and state legislatures and everyone else was like putting partisanship aside to figure this thing out, right? And we weren't talking about governors based off of them being, you know, dim governors or Republican governors. It was like a split second. And then after the positivity rate spiked in New York, okay, and then it spiked in, in you know, the DMV area and it spiked in like Chicago and in places that are uh, disproportionately democratic, like disproportionately minority, have a lot more immigrants, both documented and undocumented. It became this dynamic of having a conversation. Uh, I, just, I just remember the timeline too, because on the Hill, it, it was the difference between like our first big CARES package and then right around the time we were talking about heroes in the house and all of a sudden the the senate didn't want to play ball anymore and it's because they felt like well the coasts were hurting well what did that mean well the coast is where it's more diverse it's more democratic etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. and they didn't feel like they needed to help them okay and it's a shame because like they still have that demeanor but the areas that are spiking in the country now is red in rural america you know uh and and the, and the unfortunate thing is those parts of the country tend to have less healthcare access than the coast do, right? Not to say that is great in the coast. I mean, here within Maryland, um, you know, uh, many, many of the folks who live in urban uh, areas, whether that's Capitol Heights, Maryland, or uh, inner city Baltimore, struggle to get healthcare access the same way many of folks in, in Carroll County and Dorchester in the rural area get, right? But generally speaking, you can drive within an hour to get to a hospital. And in, in many of those places in the middle of America, you can't do that, you know? Um, and they're spiking and I don't, I don't know, it's, it's, it's very frustrating. Um, you know, it's very frustrating because, you know, I, I would have imagined we would have deployed all the resources that uh, the American co government has to bear uh, to make sure that every life mattered, you know? Um, and it's just, uh, I think we could do better. I, I think uh, to, to the policy folks who's out here who watch this, you know, when I was in policy school, we did a review of Katrina and kind of like how that happened. That was one of the case studies we had to review. I think we're gonna have something like this, um, whereas that was a little bit more bureaucratic. I think this is bureaucratic. This is more political because uh, I really, I remember reading reports of people saying like, well, you know, essentially those are Democrats who are down. Right? I'm not saying that's the position of everyone, but that was out there. Um, and and it has no place for it. There's no place for that at all. So I think it's worth noting that I, I believe um, Jared Kushner, you know, kind of disregarded New York because, you know, that's that it's a Democrat governor. Um, it's a you know, it's it, it votes pretty much blue. Um, so it's, it's, it's insane to me, right? Um, obviously that was spoken behind closed doors, but one thing that I would like to know, um, when you mentioned undocumented jazz, um, you know, because of this president's, um, overt disdain and prejudice, right? Against, um, undocumented, uh, people here in the States, you know, so many of them literally go to work and go home and don't move beyond that because of fear, right? Um, but so many of them have also died from COVID at home because they were too afraid to go to the hospital because they were afraid that they would then call ICE. And these were young people, right? Young people that could have survived it had they just gotten the help that they needed, but they couldn't because for them going back to their country, was scarier than possibly dying, 
to this disease. And I just, you know, I, I want people to understand, um, understand that, you know, and those numbers aren't counted as COVID deaths. If they did not die in a hospital, they were not, not declared COVID deaths. Um, so we don't really know how big that number is. Um, and it's been extremely trying, right, on the black and brown community specifically, right? Um, because we have this high rate of chronic disease that makes us more susceptible. Um, but just to hear of people that lost loved ones that didn't go get help, right, um, is really, it, it's just devastating. And, and if I can, um, uh, and an, another figure we don't talk about often, and, and Tsunami had the figures on this, is um, this broader population of people who have tested positive, okay, and then have come out, but still have varying conditions that they're still dealing with, right? Whether it's whether it's heart issues or breathing issues or, or, or the like. I mean, a number, I read a, a number of stories of professional athletes super afraid of contracting anything because even if they come out of it and they're healthy again, it may impact their ability to earn uh, their living um, if, if, they, if they're stuck with heart conditions and, and things of that nature. And you know, the, the conversation is one on the front end, like how do we stop the, the, the virus, but also understanding that like the quality of, of potentially millions of Americans' lives may be different now because they contracted this thing was preventable. And also how are we gonna give them appropriate treatment moving forward, especially when you have a situation where we have a Supreme Court, okay, and I know that's one of the topics we're going to hit, uh, that might be rolling back the Affordable Care Act, where you have pre-existing conditions and things of the nature. So it's like, okay, you have, I forget how many people has tested positive in the nation right now. Six and a half million. Six and a half million people. So you have six and a half million people the Affordable Care Act rolls back, now has a pre-existing condition of no fault of their own that was completely preventable uh, that, that now can inhibit them having access to, to health care. And, um, you know, so I, I would like us to talk about that too. I know, I don't know if it's our next section, but one of the sections are on the Supreme Court and we should. We should. Yeah, and just to like, I, so people can understand that, right? Like for the rest of their life, they could be denied healthcare coverage for the rest of their life because we don't know what the long-term consequences of this is. We have no idea. So, you know, if you got COVID, didn't really have many symptoms, you could have been asymptomatic, but you had it and it's on paper. And now you could be denied healthcare coverage um, because of that. Like, and I just have to make a plug for all, right. <laughs> for, for all the workers too, the essential workers. And it's been shown that they need to get paid more. A lot of them don't have health care. Uh, you know, the, all of the Bezos employees from Whole Foods and elsewhere and all the logistical chains, you know, a lot of them don't have health care and they, they're living on Medicaid and food stamps. And it's absolutely insane that this you know, 100 billionaire, 200 billionaire person can't pay his workers enough. And also focusing on meat processing plants, there's, there's a lot of these meat processing plants you talk about um, that, that are completely dependent on low wage workers living in very dangerous, precarious situations. And they were keeping them packed in together. And now they're, you know, working with uh, Congress to try to prevent any liability. Uh, going on. So it, it's really important to focus on the workers. But the next topic is the Supreme Court, and we're going to hit all this. But Sanam, did you want to add anything else? I, I am curious about on the committee, what is there a bipartisan agreement or is it, is it even lost at that subcommittee level? Um, so I, <clears throat> excuse me, I would say that it, it's, I wouldn't say that it's bipartisan. Um, I would say that it is very, bi very partisan, um, even, even in terms of examining just one, the scope of the issue. Um, obviously, I think the members do consider it to be a very urgent matter, but I wouldn't say that there is a foundational level of agreement or unity in terms of how to approach it, how to tackle it. Again, some of the very um, other issues that we mentioned just in this conversation alone are things that are debated on heavily. 
Um, and so similar to, you know, President Trump, for example, and the way that he is approached, I think that that sentiment is shared amongst some members that do sit on the, uh, on the subcommittee. And there are some members who feel very, um, who feel that the president has done an excellent job at remedying the issue and addressing the issue. So it's definitely trickled down within this space as well. But then on the other hand, you do have some very fervent actors who don't at all agree with what's what's happening and are, are working um, tirelessly to make sure that things are, are being addressed properly. Um, but if obviously if you don't have that top down support, it's it's hard to kind of get things rolling. Great, thank you for that. So moving on to the Supreme Court. So some say that Trump's top accomplishment beside his trillion dollar tax cut is the remaking of the federal judiciary based on Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who has appointed over 200 federal judges, most of which are determined by Leo Leonard's Federalist Society. So now after the death of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, President Trump seeks to appoint a third justice after Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh. And these judges will be with us for generations. Um, so I guess going into it, uh, Amy uh, Coney Barrett is the nominee. Uh, how do you think this is gonna play out in the coming weeks? And uh, I'm just gonna kind of open the floor to anyone who wants to take this first. She's gonna get nominated. I mean, she's been nominated and she's gonna, she's gonna, she's gonna become the next justice. I mean, she is um, a woman who is going to undo everything that RBG fought so hard um, to get through. Like it, it's the irony of this is just insane to me. Like, it's just devastating. Um, I'm sure everyone's read that or seen it somewhere like on social media, like every door that RBG opened, you know, for Amy to be able to get to this point, she's going to close as she walks past each one. And it's, you know, it's it, like, it's devastating. It's devastating. Um, but I do really want to just say that the grit of RBG to be fighting cancer, still hearing cases, still writing opinions, you know, um, it's just a testament to just how badass she was, but the reason why more women need to be in positions of power, because like, um, I think most women can agree, you know, that kind of never stop, you know, even when you're really, really sick, like we're caregivers and we're take caring, you know, and she knew like the weight of her, of her role. She knew that, like, I can't Im imagine the burden that that, felt like. I really can't. Um, and God knows she tried to hang in there. And it's just, it's, it's just devastating. I mean, that's. Have, have you heard about the people of praise uh, cult connected to Amy Coney Barrett? Yeah. So it, it's, it's essentially, so if, as a Supreme Court member, you want to be independent from outside influence and the whole premise of this cult is that the what they used to call handmaidens of the women part of the cult had to submit themselves not only to their husband but to the, their local chapter leader and they have to submit lists every day and like financial reports and uh i i think you you could pull that you pull that thread a little bit i know people attacked diane feinstein when she got um affirmed in 2017 to be on the the lower courts, uh, Feinstein did bring that up, uh, Senator Feinstein, but um, it's, it's problematic. And me uh, coming from a background in Catholicism, there is a, a civil war happening in the Supreme Court between uh, the current Pope Francis and the old Pope Benedict that is more aligned with the Knights of Malta, the Opus Dei, uh, some of the super far right, Bannon, Newt Gingrich, uh, groups that are that are coming through and she she personifies that unfortunately uh, some of the I think the, the biggest problem and and the whole Pope Benedict was much more connected to a lot of the pedophilia as well but I'm, I'm getting off topic so if, if I'm if I may um, first I would say 
Um, politically, there's nothing to stop her getting appointed. They, uh, you know, the Senate Republicans have gone on their tour to say they're going to be hypocrites um, and, uh, uh, you know, appoint someone when there's an election just three and a half weeks away uh, when they refused to appoint Merrick Garland a year uh, before. Um, and particularly Merrick Garland was, uh, President Obama intentionally picked someone who is a moderate uh, to try to appease to make the court less partisan. Uh, and they picked someone who is a clear partisan, uh, which I think just from the public policy standpoint, when we, when we talk about the institution of our government, I think we really need to have a conversation about the ero erosion of our institutions because the only reason why people follow the law is because they believe the law is fair and non-political. And the more political it becomes, the less likely people are to adhere to the law. And it breaks down the cohesion within our country. I do want to say that RBG was a, uh, a, a legend uh, that will never be, be met. Um, and all honesty, I have to call her out for the lack of diversity she's had on the clerks in her office. She only had one over her tenure, and that's completely unacceptable, uh, particularly given that the stature we give her, that majority of the, uh, what we consider the more conservative justices, have more diversity among their staff than she did. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, she is notorious, and I, and I give her all her praise, uh, but I got to be fair on that. For, you know, for, for Barrett, um, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, the, the whole purpose of having a Supreme Court where you're appointed to for life is that once you get there, you can be free from the influences of special interests and partisan politics uh, to do what is ultimately right. Um, and, and, you know, and maybe, maybe she does, right? Uh, many people thought that the Affordable Care Act was going to be abolished uh, a few years ago and uh, Chief Justice Roberts ended up voting with the more liberal wing to maintain it, okay? He had some conservative concerns on why he ended up voting to maintain it, um, but, you, but you don't know. Um, in, in fairness, you don't know. It's not hopeful given her dissents, um, but, but you don't know. Uh, but but I am really I am more concerned about how um, how the appointment process for people getting on the court from when Ruth Bader Ginsburg was appointed to now. Back then, it wasn't multi-million dollar campaigns run by corporations um, and other special interests, and now it is. And I think that's a serious problem uh, for the cohesion of our country. I just have to interject too with um, the partisanship. I mean, the, the, the Federalist Society led by this guy, uh, Leonard Leo, he is actually a bona fide uh, representative of the Knights of Malta. It, it's insane, but, and you look at the Federalist Society and um, they, they have tremendous influence on creating this, this new judiciary. And even Brett Kavanaugh, no one ever really went deep into the fact that he got his like a two hundred thousand dollars of debt paid off right beforehand. Uh, he got like country club paid off. He got his like mortgage paid off, and no one knows who actually paid that off. Um, so you you would hope these people get into office uh, with integrity or at least independence. Um, I'm I'm kind of concerned. Not, um, but I I guess what what can you do if you're you're the opposition? Do you just boycott the hearings or do you act like go through the procedures? Do you try to stack the courts afterwards without saying it right now? Um, but what, what are some of the, the strategies and tactics that you could employ? The courts used to be bigger than they are now. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be stacking, it'd be returning, but uh, you know, tomato, tomato. <laughs> um, I, I think they should participate in the hearings personally. I think they should still try to um, get Barrett on record for saying what she believes, what she would in, potentially intend to do, because it builds a case that, um, you know, maybe she shocks. But if she's essentially going to say that she's going to be a partisan on the court, then it builds an argument for uh, a Nets administration to, to do whatever they deem is appropriate, is the point, right? Um, it gives them an opportunity to investigate her and ask questions like Evan just brought up. You know, if, if, if folks have the time and ability to see 
uh, bank records and stuff and see if, oh, if a random person just paid for something. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't know how that information uh, came available, but like to, to essentially determine, are you bought and sold by anything? Is our, the highest court of our land will be bought and sold? Uh, and if so, then maybe some of the conservatives um, in the United States Senate, who I think were leaning towards voting for someone, uh, might not feel comfortable uh, with that. You know, um, there's been a couple who's, who's expressed not that they wouldn't vote for her, but they don't think that there should be a vote before the election. Um, you know, I, I do think that as Donald Trump is dropping in the polls, you're starting to see um, more folks within the Republican Party grow more bolden to uh, distance themselves with him here and there. I think um, the conservative part, the, the, the conservatives broadly, evangelicals specifically, are so focused on the court, it's hard for them to do that on this issue. But uh, you, are, you are seeing the, the frame starting to occur. So. Yeah, so I'm, you know, being around uh, way back, I, I think we were all around, but um, the, the 2000 elections, the, the partisan 5-4 vote uh, to stop counting votes, uh, it, the judiciary, I think, is a reflection of, of just partisanship, ultimately. Um, and, and I think one of the reasons why Trump needs to get her uh, sworn in before the election is that they may need to rely on the Supreme Court at, at a 6-3 majority uh, to push it through. And maybe a 5-4 or, uh, or whatever, whatever it is right now um, is, is a little too close. Uh, the five three may be a little too close because a Republican may waver a little bit to give the election to Trump, but a, a six three will will ensure that that happens. But um, anything else on this before we move to the 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 election integrity? All right, cool. Well, I'll I'll jump in, and uh, as we get into our final topic, uh, the election is. Gosh, less than less than six weeks away, almost five weeks, I guess. So Vox wrote on September 14th, the United States has a president who received nearly three million fewer votes than his Democratic opponent. And over half the country lives in just nine states, which means that less than half the population controls 82% of the Senate. Uh, intentional efforts to make it harder to vote, such as voter ID laws, are increasingly common throughout the states and the Supreme Court frequently uh, approaching voter suppression with indifference. And of course, there's gerrymandering. And uh, a lot of the elections now are, are being funded by wealthy donors. So we can talk about a lot of different issues under this topic. But I, I just can't think of what could be more anti-democratic than a system that allows a minority to rule the government. Uh, I think this needs to change. Uh, but as we go into these elections, um, I, I kind of want to just open up the floor. How, what are you thinking? What, what are you doing to, to try to get the vote out? Um, and yeah, what, what are you preparing for? There's a lot there to unpackage. Okay, so um, regarding the elections, right? It's um, funny that Jazz was talking about Supreme Court and um, how we have an election in a, in, you know, in a few weeks. Um, people are already voting now, right? So we are in an election. Um, and this is going to be a historic election because of the level of Democrats that are going to be voting by mail. Um, statistically, well, I, no, I'm sorry, historically, that's a Republican thing to do. Um, the GOP has honestly been brilliant in terms of um, pushing education around you know, mailing, mailing in your ballots. I mean, that's literally their MO. And um, so it's ironic again to see Trump, um, you know, literally biting away at that process, right? After they've spent so much time, you know, to, to so much time, energy and attention efforts into getting people to trust the ballot. That being said, um, you know, I think maybe Trump was a necessary evil because I think we've now realized just how fragile our systems are. Um, no one has ever tried, right, um, to 
test the boundaries, test the limits, test, um, you know, the powers that are supposed to be um, checking and balancing, right, our, our, our branches of government. Um, so I think, and I hope, um, if he doesn't win, that that's going to be something that we somehow codify. But moreover, um, and I don't know what this means. I don't know what this looks like. And I'll be honest, I'm very afraid of saying things and then not fully thinking about what happens if it's on the other side, right? Like if it was for us, like if, if, if that was attempted, right, um, to go against uh, Democrats. Non-disclosure, I'm a Democrat. But anyways, um, but you know, when you think about um, how virtually anybody can run for president, anybody. And if you get enough support, you can be president. So here's a man who, you know, um, on paper is just shady. I mean, shady, 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 has always been shady. Um, everything he touches literally dies. The only thing he's been really smart at is branding himself. So because people see Trump something everywhere, they automatically think this guy is just a brilliant businessman. He's actually quite the opposite. Um, and so now here we are, like, you can't, I can't get a job, you know, for the federal government if I've filed for bankruptcy. How has he filed for bankruptcy? I don't know how many times. And he's the president of the United States. Like, he has debt. Little, like, the amount of debt that this man has is insane. You know, but if I had a $50,000 Nordstrom card, I would, you know, I would be a risk to work at the federal government because I could somehow um, be coerced, right, to somebody pay it off for me. And then all of a sudden I could, you know, I could, I could be a little crooked, right? Like, how do we not have um, systems in place, even for our elected officials? And I, that's why I say I feel like I'm speaking this out um, because I do want absolutely anyone to be able to run for office. Like, the only way we're going to change all of these systems and the way our government functions um, is through representation. So I want to continue to see um, you know, people like Jazz Lewis, people like Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, you know, like, you know, have these incredible careers, right? And maybe it shouldn't have happened, right? At least on paper. And I don't mean anything against you, Jazz, because I honestly have no idea what your background is. But like, you know, for a Puerto Rican girl, you know, you know, who was waiting tables one year and then she's, you know, sitting in the Capitol building, you know, grueling. Um, people, um, crooked people, um, it's pretty badass, right? So like I, like, I don't know how to protect that process at the same time. And I'm not gonna say that there aren't any crooked Democrats because I'm sure there are, I know there are. Um, but what I'm saying is like, they have the Steve Kings. They have, you know, the, <laughs> the Donald Trumps. Um, you know, just crooked people um, or probably racist people, right? That can get elected. Like, how can we change that system, right? To make that more intact. Like, we cannot ever be in a position if this man gets voted out of office. And I say that, honestly. Um, Evan, you started this podcast off by saying that this is a blowout. I don't, I don't agree with that. Yeah. I just don't. Um, you know, your mom's friend in Ohio that says she was so, um, you know, taken aback by his, 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 you know, performance last night. Okay. She might forget about that next week. You know, if there's one thing that we are here in the States, we forget about things that happened like yesterday, if it's to our convenience, right? That's the reason why we keep doing this with the policing and the videos and, and, and you know, people just keep forgetting. And then, you know, and then, you know, another life gets taken and everybody goes to the street and they're like, oh, you know, it's just one, you know, one bad apple or something. Like we tend to forget these things. So I don't trust your mom's friend in Ohio, honestly. But moreover, if this guy gets out of office, right, how do we protect ourselves from this ever happening again? Because 
he's literally, if he gets reelected, literally screw our democracy. So I mean, that's just the reality. So let's let's kick it to the people on the hill. Uh, what are you seeing on the hill? What, what's the what's the gossip? For me, um, honestly, I think people are very much set in their ways and their ideals and their beliefs. And so obviously people who work on the Hill are very civically engaged and whatever else, but I don't feel that I personally haven't encountered people that I feel are necessarily going to sway in their political leanings. If anything, they're very staunch in where they stand and where they lie. One thing I can say sort of like not Hill related and just in terms of like my peer group and amongst my friends and people who are of a similar <laughs> background to me, that being black, um, I know a lot of young people who don't want to vote and who don't see the purpose in doing it. Not so much as a matter of, oh, well, like my vote doesn't count, but more so the system in and of itself, they feel needs to be completely dismantled, completely reframed and restructured. And therefore they feel that whoever they vote, even if that person is maybe leans closer to their ideals or viewpoint, um, isn't really going to see them. And I, I think sort of to reiterate the point of, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and issues of police brutality and whatever else, I think these are just very telling instances of like, okay, yes, like we're voting, we're doing this, but do the individuals in office, do those um, individuals who are supposed to be representing us truly see our humanity? And are they going to ensure that they protect that at all costs? And so a lot of people don't feel that way. I know for myself, I'm going to vote and of course encourage my peers to vote and whatever else. Um, but I don't think that there's a very collectively shared belief that like their vote is going to change, you know, the fact that they're in poverty, the fact that they can walk down the street and, you know, be profiled and in turn lose their life at the hands of an officer, like all of these things, like the vote to them does not matter. Um, and I, I think that those are the individuals that people like Donald Trump, well, maybe not Donald Trump, but Joe Biden um, should really tap into because they don't feel seen. Um, and those votes could be vital in, in changing the tide of the results of the election, because I don't want to be cynical and say that Trump's going to win again. Like, I really would pray and hope that he does not. But um, similar to what Esther said, I wouldn't be surprised if it happened. I just want to say that um, Sanam and I were actually texting back and forth, and um, I do think that was a huge missed opportunity for Biden during this debate. Um, there was a specific question to ask about policing, and, you know, he hit, I, I mean, that he hit us with the, there's a few bad apples, and, like, we need to stop pushing that narrative. We need to stop pushing that narrative, and the reality is, even if you're not or don't condone, right, that kind of activity. Um, it, you know, if you're silent, you're complicit. I mean, that's, that's just the reality because we're talking about people's lives here. Um, so he, it was a huge missed opportunity for him. I think he could have delivered, um, I think he could have delivered an answer with a lot more conviction, right? And I, again, missed opportunity. If I was one of Senum's friends, you know, and I see that, I'd be like, see, there's no point in me voting. You know what I'm saying? And what I would say to Senum's friends is, you know, 200 judges, right, Evan? What if Biden, you know, if, if Hillary could have nominated 200 judges and they should have been put, like, they would not. That, that's how we hit the policy, right? That's how we change these policies. So that, that way um, we can make differences in, in um, underrepresented communities, right? Yeah. On, All about on, on, on the tactical side, I mean, I just bring up, why is one side spending so much time and resources trying to suppress the vote <laughs> and the other side is trying to get the vote out? So that clearly right there, I think indicates something, but I wanna pass it on to Jazz. Uh, we're, we're running out of time. Uh, so Jazz, what, what are some of your thoughts? Um, I, I, I have a couple. Uh, I posted in the chat uh, for, for us that bad apples come from rotten trees, right? Um, which is a phrase that's come around that I do think on the one side is a missed opportunity. And I would advise anyone close to the president to really give him some advice to think about what that phrase means. Um, because, um, you know, not only do we want officers to speak up about 
uh, let's say, bad other officers, okay? But officers are trained in an environment that is approved upon by a system, okay? Whether they're commanding officers and whoever, and it's just like any other environment, whether it's a home environment, a school environment, you know, like people do things based off of the incentives and disincentives that you put in front of them. And if you have this widespread belief, which is a fact, right, that the police do not treat everyone the same, and generally there's no accountability for police regardless of your color, it's not a black problem, okay? There's, there's no accountability for police, then how did we get here? It is a system, okay? So then you have to reform that entire system. Now you can say, that's not to say that all officers are bad, okay? You don't, I know the reason why people say that there are some bad actors. They say it because they don't want to hurt the feelings of good officers, okay? But you can do one better by saying this system created an environment where if you're a good officer, you report that a bad officer is doing something, you get looked over for promotions, you get forced out, you know, I mean, all sorts of things happen to you and that's not okay. We're not doing any favors to that good officer uh, by maintaining a rod and system. On the election integrity part, I want to say one, I kind of ditto Evan's point. Um, if your vote didn't matter, folks wouldn't go out of their way through policy and through other ways to try to get you to think it doesn't matter, right? So that in and of itself means that you should desire doing this thing. The other part is that like, look, you you know, we have to get away from this Messiah complex. You know, like, I don't need Joe Biden uh, to be Moses for me. You know, I don't need him part of waters. You know what I mean? I don't need him calling in locusts. I don't need him doing none of that stuff. You know what I mean? All I need him to do is win. And then folks who I may be connected to who can put pressure on him, be that my local Congress member, be that a celebrity I like who, who can call him, be that me sending him a letter, I feel more like that I can put pressure on the people close to Joe Biden than I ever can with Donald Trump. And that is all that matters, right? And I, and I think you're already doing it. I think the electorate should be, should be proud. Like, you know, Kamala Harris, regardless of it, however people feel like Kamala Harris, like a black woman did not become the Democratic nominee for vice president without people leveraging power to apply pressure on Joe Biden and those around him to make him think that that is what he had to do. Okay, it's not to say that he doesn't like her. I'm just saying that these types of decisions aren't made out of a context of power. And people are leveraging that power, which means that our system is very bent and wrong headed in certain ways, but is not completely broken or else, uh, you know, she wouldn't be up there. And I'm not, I'm not trying to say that everyone agrees with whatever Kamala Harris represents to you. I'm just saying the fact that a woman, check, a black woman, check, a immigrant woman experience, check, you know, a woman who came from an HBCU, like neither one of them have a Ivy League background, check, is there is because people applied some type of power. And that means that um, the folks close to them are probably more like you and you can put pressure on those people to do the type of things you want, such as talk about immigration. I mean, we're, we're talking about, he has a whole plan on racial wealth inequality. That would not happen if there weren't vestiges of the broader Democratic Party putting pressure on him to do so. And then if he wins, he has to make good on that if he wants to maintain his coalition, you know? So um, I, I just wanna say, don't believe the hype. Your vote matters. Um, you know, tell everyone they need to vote. Even if you think your vote doesn't matter, just vote just in case, <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, that's a great way to end uh, the conversation this week. Uh, again, I, I wanna thank you all for tuning in. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear them. And we are gonna be posting this on Facebook and YouTube. We also have it on an audio channel as well. And uh, tune in next week. Thanks a lot, everyone, for coming on today. Thanks. Have a good one. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.